that the broadcast of the regular meeting of the Minneapolis City Council will now begin. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Lisa Bender. I'm the president of the Minneapolis City Council. I'm going to call to order this regular meeting for Friday, May 28th. Before we proceed, I'll note that we have remote participation by council members and city staff as authorized under the provisions of Minnesota Open Meeting Law, Section 13D.021, due to the declared state of local public health emergency. The city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to the Minnesota Open Meeting Law. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll to verify the presence of a quorum. Council Member Goodman. Present. Council Member Johnson. Present. Council Member Palmisano. Present. Council Member Gordon. Here. Council Member Cano. Here. Council Member Reich. Here. Council Member Fletcher. Here. Council Member Schrader. Here. Council Member Osman. Here. Council Member Cunningham. Present. Council Member Ellison. Present. Vice President Jenkins. Here. President Bender. Here. There are 13 members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. The agenda for today's meeting is before us. Are there any amendments to the agenda? Seeing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. The clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Pomisano. Aye. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Allison. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries in the agenda is adopted. Next, we have the minutes from our regular meeting of May, 20, May 14th for acceptance. May I have a motion to accept those minutes? So moved. Second. The clerk will call the roll. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Palmisano. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Cano. Aye. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Fletcher. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and those minutes are accepted. Finally, we have the referral of petitions, communications and reports to the proper committees. May I have that motion, please? So moved. Second. The clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmisano. Aye. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and those matters are referred. That brings us to new business and the first item of business this morning is a special presentation offered by our employees. One that was created, developed and has been led by employees from across the entire city enterprise to address their commitment to racial equity, justice, truth telling and reconciliation. Daniel LaCroix from our regulatory services department is with us this morning, joining from the council chamber, and he will read this employee letter to us. At this time, I'd like to recognize Mr. LaCroix for the reading of this employee letter of commitment. Welcome, and thank you for being at our meeting today. Thank you, council uh, president. Uh, I wanna also thank uh, all the council members for allowing me the opportunity uh, to read this uh, important document today. Um, but before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, we are on stolen land, uh, Dakota and Anishinaabe uh, land uh, dated 12,000 years. Um, we currently make up 1.4% of Minneapolis's population, um, but we are resilient, proud, and we are still here. Um, 
with that, uh, again, my name is Daniel LaCroix. My Dakota name is Sintana Tokshina, meaning Bluebird Boy. Um, and again, I just want to thank you. Um, we are Minneapolis employees who perform the day-to-day -day public service that makes our city run. We help businesses grow. We keep streets and sidewalks well maintained. We enforce ordinances and laws that keep people safe. We answer calls and ex explain bureaucratic systems in hopes to make them simpler and more equitable. And we hurt and are traumatized alongside this community we love and serve. Many of us live in Minneapolis. All of us work every day to create a Minneapolis that all people can enjoy. To get on the path to healing, any commitment we make must be based in truth telling and racial rec reconciliation. To that end, we acknowledge the devastating intergenerational harms of systemic racism and racial injustice. We recognize we can never undo the past, but we can hold ourselves and each other accountable to listening and learning from the Black, Indigenous, Asian Pacific Islander, Latinx, and people of color and those who have been negatively impacted by the city. We accept all collective responsibility for pain we have caused if we've done our jobs and as stewards of the city of Minneapolis's policies. We acknowledge that this work is not singular, but collective. All city, <clears throat> all city of Minneapolis employees are in this worthy endeavor together, regardless of department, division, race, religion, sexual orientation, or gender identity, color, or nationality in any attribute that makes us beautifully different. As employees of the city of Minneapolis, those who have signed this letter commit to recognizing that racism is a public health emergency, declaring our commitment to not just identify, but take decisive, meaningful action towards the creation of an anti-racist culture in our personal and professional lives. Recognizing the city of Minneapolis as a government entity has historically divided and caused harm to black, indigenous, Asian Pacific Islander, Latinx, people of color, residents and staff, and that despite our current efforts, these practices continue today. Centering impacted voices as we speak, seek solutions to combat systemic racism and injustice within the city of Minneapolis enterprise and the city at large. We may not make policy and we often are not the final decision makers, but we need to, but we don't need to be. We don't need to be formal leaders to move the city of Minneapolis toward racial reckoning and justice. We will need to be courageous, passionate, unwavering, and we are. Um, city employees can find uh, the commitment letter on uh, the City Talk webpage on the front page. Um, and again, I want to thank council member, uh, council members and council president for allowing me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing these powerful words today. Um, my understanding is that this is open for all city employees to sign um, and it will be open for a while for those who want to add their names. Um, I, I guess I want to acknowledge that those, this statement shouldn't shouldn't need to feel courageous. This should be baked into our systems and what we all commit to unwaveringly every day, but it is. And our staff of color in particular in the city of Minneapolis have been carrying the burden of white supremacy throughout our systems every day for a very long time. And it is really our responsibility as policymakers to create an environment where that isn't the case and where one does not need to take risks or be courageous in order to speak out for racial justice and anti-racism. So I just want to acknowledge that um, it takes it does take courage in our system today and really thank all of the employees who've provided leadership through this, through the um, activities that were planned earlier this week on the anniversary of George Floyd's murder, and everyone who has worked for every day for, for many, many years, um, often without recognition, often without the full support of the policymakers 
of our city. And like you, we need to um, acknowledge and recognize our part in in those harms, those past harms, and our responsibility in moving forward together. Thank you. Thank you. Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, uh, Mr. LaCroix and all the employees who um, put together this powerful document expressing um, the need for for racial reckoning, for healing, uh, for truth telling. It is, um, in many ways, it is courageous. Um, you know, 20 years ago, any employee that would do this in any workplace would be immediately met with um, dismissal. Um, and so, um, you know, this, this age that we are in, it, it calls for, um, for courage, for, for thoughtfulness and for, for leadership. And that what, that's what we are witnessing in this moment right now. And so just want to thank you all for continuing to, to stand in your truth, to challenge, um, not only us as policymakers, but our entire city to step up and and recognize the harms and and to to step forward and do the work that we need to heal. So just a deep heartfelt thank you to all who participated um, in 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 putting this together and for everyone who shares their sentiments to to move this work forward. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Council Member Schrader. Uh, thank you, Council President. I don't have anything uh, additional besides just wanted to echo, um, like I really appreciate yours and the Council by President's words and just wanted staff to know that those those feelings were um, felt through many of us on Council um, and also just wanted to say, uh, you know, I consider this job an honor and just it's an honor to serve with everyone worth uh, all the city employees as well. So thank you. Thank you. Anything further? Seeing none, I will direct the clerk to file that letter so it will become part of the city's official public record with deep appreciation for all of our employees at the city. Our next item is the regular COVID status report. That report was circulated to all council members and is linked for public access to the meeting agenda in LIMS. Staff are available to respond to any questions from council members. Are there any questions about the report? And I believe today uh, we have our Commissioner of Health and staff from the Health Department available to answer questions. I don't see any questions or comments today. Um, I will just note that we did have a robust discussion of, um, of the new guidelines that had just come out a couple of weeks ago and our own city's unique circumstances related to uh, mask regulations and our COVID regulations. So we just appreciate the ongoing guidance that we're all receiving from the city's health department staff and others as we navigate this time period in our city. So without objection, I will direct the clerk to file that report. With that, we'll proceed to the reports of standing committees. Um, I th think I'm actually going to um, take us a bit out of order. I think there was still some un, uh, loose ends related to the Viz committee, and I just want to make sure that that is all ready to go as it needs to be. So I'm going to um, instead start with the Policy and Government Oversight Committee and come back to Biz at the end. Um, so uh, Council Vice President Jenkins will be presenting the report from the Policy and Government Oversight Committee. Council Vice President. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, the Policy and Government Oversight uh, Committee is bringing forward 17 items today. Items one and two are appointed positions in the city coordinator's office. Um, item number three is an appointment of Jonathan Ahn 
to the Capital Long Range Improvements Committee. Item number four is a gift acceptance from the Polad Family Foundation to support transforming public safety. Items five and six are legal settlements. Items seven through 17 are various contract amendments to the new public service building project. And Madam President, uh, I move approval of the Policy and Government Oversight Committee report. Thank you. Council Vice President has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Palmasano. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Cano. Aye. Council Member Reich. Aye. Council Member Fletcher. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and that report is adopted. The next report is from the Public Health and Safety Committee presented by the Chair, Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Madam President. The Public Health and Safety Committee brings forward um, eight items for approval today. The first is passage of a resolution establishing a new Northern Metals Settlement Advisory Board. Item number two is accepting a grant from the Minnesota Department of Health for enhanced blood lead testing, lead poisoning prevention, and asthma education. Item number three is accepting a grant from Hennepin County uh, for the 2020 Justice Assistance Grant for the Police Department and City Attorney's Office. Item number four is authorizing a contract with the League of Minnesota Cities Insurance Trust for Patrol, a Peace Officer Accredited Training Online Subscription. Item number five is authorizing master contracts with uh, uh, that between the Minneapolis Health Department and Planned Parenthood of Minnesota and the Domestic Abuse Project. Item number six is authorizing the submittal of a grant application to the CDC for COVID-19 response, um, particularly focused on health disparities among high risk and underserved populations. Item number seven is acceptance of reimbursement dollars from Urban Scholar Partner Organizations. Item number and item number eight is accepting a grant from the Minnesota Department of Health to reduce opioid use and misuse uh, among children and youth. I will move approval of all eight items. Councilmember Cunningham has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and that report is adopted. Next is a report from the Transportation and Public Works Committee presented by the Chair, Council Member Reich. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the committee forwards 12 items today for full council consideration. Item one is a joint powers agreement with the City of Edina for asphalt paving and striping at the 54th Street uh, Road project. Two is the biennial routine maintenance agreement between the City of Minneapolis and MnDOT. Three is the Whittier International Elementary School Safe Routes to School project and its acceptance of a grant. Four is the East Street uh, Southeast Street Reconstruction Project and street lighting and it's rescinding some of the actions uh, as listed. Five is the grant application to the National Association of City Transportation Officials uh, Pandemic Response Recovery Grant for the 18th Avenue South Little Earth Transportation Study. Six is the grant application for the 2021 MnDOT Metro Local Partnership Program. Seven was the uh, event permit for the George Floyd Remembrance Block Party. Eight is the bid for the rental of motor grader units. Nine is the bid for the 2021 large diameter cured in place pipe project. 
10 is the bid for the 2021 sanitary sewer televising project. 11 is the bid for cleaning and lining of water mains project. And 12 is the 2021 Public Works Week uh, resolution that we read in committee, honoring the fine work of the department serving our city so well. Uh, Madam President, I move all items as submitted. Councilmember Reich has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and that report is adopted. That brings us to the um, back to the report of the Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee given by the chair, Councilmember Goodman. Thank you, Madam President. The sorry, I have to go all the way back. The Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee is bringing forward 15 items for approval this morning. Item one is a PACE financing project for Landucci's, um, which is at the 9th Street Flats project. Item number two is an interim use permit at 4040 Washington Avenue North. Item number three is Al Treviso Taqueria, which is uh, a new business opening in an old location, uh, and this is a liquor license. Item four is the renter protection ordinance. Item five is a variance appeal. This is granting the appeal. Item number six is a zoning administrator appeal, and we are denying that appeal. Item seven are the liquor license approvals, and eight are the license renewals. Item number nine is gambling approvals. Item number 10 is the Great Streets Facade Improvement Matching Grant Program and Cultural Corridor Interior Improvement Pilot Guidelines. Item number 11 is Neighborhood Works um, Build Wealth Contract Amendments for Grow North's pilot project. Item 12 is a technical amendment to the George Floyd Square 38th and Chicago Forgivable Loan Program. Item 13 is a rezoning at 200 Plymouth. Item 14 is the Affordable Housing Trust Fund policy and procedure guidelines, as well as the notice of funding availability. And item number 15 is a similar thing. It's the 2022-23 Housing Tax Credit Program. It's our QAP and procedural manual. With that, I'll move items one through 15 for approval this morning. Councilmember Goodman has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Uh, Councilmember Schrader. Sorry, Madam President, I don't think that's from before. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Councilmember Gordon. I would like to uh, pull number four for a uh, staff direction. Great. Um, why don't we go ahead and I'll just call the roll on the um, other items and then we can just return back to item four. So uh, is there any discussion on any of the items aside from item four? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Allison. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Mender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and those items are adopted. That returns us to item four, which is an ordinance related to uh, pre-eviction notification and I'll recognize Council Member Gordon. Thank you very much. And um, I talked about this at Committee of the Whole. We also had a big discussion at the committee um, and um, had a chance to uh, dig into it a little more um, since Committee of the Whole. And I appreciate the concerns that we've heard from staff and others about extending it past the 14 days. My theory right now is 
that we move the ordinance as recommended. And we also move a staff direction to explore uh, possible possible changes to the ordinance in the future. Um, I don't know really what order to take them in, and maybe we could do them both at the same time if it um, is all right. President Bender, I can read the staff direction and talk to that a little bit more. Great, thank you, Councilmember. So I guess it's um, on the screen now, hopefully, that everybody can see. Um, you know, there's we heard a lot at the public hearing. We heard a lot before the ordinance was drafted that 14 days isn't going to be enough. Um, and I appreciate that and I have concerns about that. Um, we've done some analysis of what other states and cities have done and 14 days seems like it's a very common maximum. And we've heard some concerns about implementation and um, having a strong ordinance if we exceed that. I still would like to see it go to 21 or 30. Um, so part of that is captured in this staff direction, but also we um, are one opportunity to explore something else, which is a number one, which would um, be looking at prohibiting the filing of an eviction action based on non-payment of rent against a tenant who has applied for federal, state, or local government rental assistance. If we were able to do that, it would have a very similar effect to extending it to 30 days, because if somebody had applied within the 14, and it would give them enough time to apply. Now, we don't, we haven't had time to do the full analysis and see um, if that's something we can do in the ordinance. So I'm directing the city attorney's office to research and make a recommendation regarding that. Uh, and also directing community planning and economic development department to report back to the city council one year after implementation of the ordinance with a recommendation regarding lengthening the notice requirement from 14 to 30 days. I think this is probably closer to what we have for a consensus on the council. I think if we are taking a step forward, um, creating this notice, and hopefully we can strengthen it later in the future based on information we get from our staff. So if I can move both items together, I will do that. Thank you, council member. I'll second the staff direction and um, when we vote, I'll just see if there's any objection to, to doing them at the same time. So we'll just take discussion on both the um, staff direction and the underlying uh, motion to adopt the ordinance. I put myself in queue and I'm happy to be a co-author of this ordinance along with council members Gordon, Allison, and Osman. Um, this is an, an example of a place where the city of Minneapolis is stepping up like many other local governments in the context of state law that does not fairly protect people who rent their homes who make up more than half of our city's population. Minnesota is one of only two states in the entire country that does not require pre-eviction notification. This is the most simple and basic of consumer protections for people who rent their homes. It simply says that before filing an eviction, which can have devastating lifetime effects on people who rent their homes, creating an enormous barrier to future housing and leaving people homeless, sleeping in our parks, literally because they have an eviction filing on their record. Um, and it just simply says that before taking that action, the landlord has to give a letter. It can be a friendly letter that says, you owe me this much rent and if you don't pay that by this time, you will be evicted. One of the reasons this protection is so important is because we know that renters often have applied for rental assistance, but aren't able to access rental assistance funds because they don't have written proof that they're about to be evicted. And so the system isn't working. The system right now is set up to be antagonistic between landlords and renters and very disproportionately advantage landlords over people who rent their homes. Uh, so this is, again, the city stepping up, um, you know, in support of those of the state legislature who have been fighting to have this very basic protection. It is only Minnesota and West Virginia who have no written notification requirements for renters. Um, and we need to keep supporting and advocating for a state law change in this space. But absent that, we have to do all that we can to make sure that people aren't facing mass eviction um, as the moratorium 
on evictions may lift um, in the in the near future. And you know, I think we just can't emphasize enough how much these small basic shifts in the in the eviction system in the housing court system would help get us better outcomes of keeping people in their homes. Um, even before the pandemic, Hennepin County had millions of dollars in unspent rental assistance because tenants didn't have time or you know, just the basic written uh, evidence that they needed the, um, to access rental assistance or to avoid eviction. We've, we've also heard stories of folks who you know, have a job, they have income, and they aren't able to find housing because they have an eviction filing on their record. We did pass an ordinance um, a couple of years ago limiting the look back period on that eviction but it does not provide full support um, it's much better to avoid evictions in the first place this policy is part of a package of protections that we've put in place and aligns really well with strategies that we continue to pursue like the right to counsel ordinance that we're giving notice on later in this agenda so what we're really doing is doing everything in the city's power to create a more uh, mediation focused environment where we're able to pair renters with the millions of dollars of rental assistance that are available, especially since in Minnesota, it really does seem to be the st strategy at the state to say, well, we're going to lift, the, you know, when and if the um, renter uh, eviction moratorium is lifted, um, we're very thankful for that moratorium. In that case, we are one of um, we have some of the strongest protections for renters under COVID in the country, but as that protection lifts, if renters don't have time to access the millions of dollars that have been set aside for rental assistance, we are going to see a massive wave of evictions across the state of Minnesota, and uh, we are all going to feel the ramifications of that at the local level, where we scramble to try to get people into shelter, while we scramble to deal with a fallout of mass evictions in our state. So um, I just want to deeply appreciate the leadership of Councilmember Gordon and my co-authors who have been pushing for the strongest possible protections. I do think that it is the right thing for us to adopt a 14-day ordinance as a first step, as a start, that we feel confident that if we are sued, as we often are when we're working to protect renters or working people in our city, that we can have a strong defense and make sure that our renters are protected. And I appreciate Councilmember Gordon's leadership in making sure those next steps of working to strengthen this policy are already in motion with the support of our staff who I've talked with and are 100% behind us doing all that we can to avoid evictions for our neighbors. Councilmember Ellison. <clears throat> Thank you, Council President. Uh, I can't say it much better than that. Um, I'm proud to be uh, a co-author and want to thank Councilmember Gordon for his leadership uh, on this as well. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, the council president spoke well to why this is a needed protection, but I also uh, want to speak to why I'm I'm supporting the staff direction. Um, I think that this 14 days is something. It's good. It will have a positive impact on um, renters' ability to, to access support. Uh, but I do think that this ordinance could be strengthened. Uh, it's important that we get this protection uh, on the books now as quickly as possible. Uh, but I do think it's important that we also look for ways to strengthen it. And that's what this staff direction does. The scope is narrow. The aims are very specific. Uh, and so I want to appreciate Councilmember Gordon for, uh, for, for stepping into that and uh, making sure that, that those next steps are teed up and not sort of loosely you know, alluded to or promised, but but actually, um, uh, you know, given given some direction. Uh, and I want to thank staff who, you know, continue to support um, council members and support our residents as uh, we try to strengthen tenant protections in our city uh, and and protect renters from from ending up um, with evictions on their record, with uh, you know, um, and and unable to access housing. So. Um, I'll be supporting the staff direction. Obviously, be supporting the 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 underlying uh, ordinance. And um, yes, just want to thank everybody involved. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Is there any objection to taking up the staff direction and the ordinance at the same time? 
Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and that is adopted. The ordinance and the staff direction. That concludes the reports of our standing committees. We do have a report from um, our executive committee today and that will be presented by Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you again, Madam President. The executive committee brings forward one item today, which is the appointment, I'm sorry, the appointed position of Director of HR Internal Workplace Investigations uh, uh, position in Human Resources. And I move that this item be referred to the Policy Government Oversight Committee. Council Vice President has moved the committee report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Palmasano. Aye. Councilmember Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Rank. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and that is referred to POGO in the next cycle. The next order of business is notice of ordinance introductions. We have one notice this morning, which is from council members Gordon, Ellison, and myself related to amending the Civil Rights Code to add a new chapter 143 entitled Right to Counsel and creating a right to counsel for tenants facing eviction. I was able to send an email yesterday to council members um, with some of the background that we had received from staff on this issue a while ago. Um, are there any questions from council members? See none, notice is given and no further action is required at this time. Next is the ordinance and referral calendar. Uh, introduction and referral calendar and we have one item this morning this is an introduction by council members Kano Jenkins I'm pausing council member oh no sorry that was from before I I still miss the speaker management <laughs> uh, and the chat is not as good okay I'll start over so now we have the introduction and referral calendar we have one item this morning this is an introduction by council member Kano Jenkins and Reich related to a proposal tied to the creation of a new arts and cultural affairs department through an amendment to chapter 21. This notice is directly tied to the prior notice and introduction that was made at the council's regular meeting on April 16th. It's a clerical correction that prior uh, to that prior subject matter introduction that was missing in the draft that was missed in the drafting process. Uh, the intention here is to ensure full notice of all parts of the code that are impacted by the proposal and um, I understand that the intent is for the committee to unite those separate parts into a single ordinance. So it's cleaning up the clerical error. This item requires unanimous approval to introduce and refer the matter to POGO so that the unified ordinance can proceed. Are there any questions from council members on this notice? Seeing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council member Goodman. Aye. Council member Johnson. Aye. Council member Palmasano. Aye. Council member Gordon. Aye. Councilmember Cano. Aye. Councilmember Reich. Aye. Councilmember Fletcher. Aye. Councilmember Schrader. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Cunningham. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and the item is referred to POGO in the next cycle where it will be combined with the prior introduction and the public hearing will be set for a future cycle. Next we have resolutions and we have one resolution today uh, which is the clear air clean air month honorary resolution. 
Are there any comments from council members on this resolution? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Um, myself and council member Ellison would like to share this resolution out loud if that is um, amenable to yes. the chair. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so um, as, you, as everyone knows, um, we've had some challenges to our um, air quality in the city of Minneapolis, most recently um, um, uh, a fire at the Northern Metals plant. But in addition, um, in this time of, of COVID-19, which impacts um, people's lung capacity and, and breathing, uh, it's just important for us to really acknowledge and recognize and to continue to try and clean and make sure that the air quality is um, suitable for all Minneapolis residents. And so we want to honor um, the fact that this month is um, May is clean air month in the city of Minneapolis, whereas the American Lung Association has annually promoted and celebrated the month of May as a clean air month since 1994 in order to educate the public on the connection between clean air and human health and clean air month um, has since been honored by states and municipalities around the country. And whereas air quality in Minnesota currently meets the federal standards, even low and moderate levels of air pollution can contribute to the serious illnesses and early death. In Minnesota, 32% of all communities have air pollution related risk above health uh, guidelines. However, the percentages of communities of color and lower income communities that experience risk above health guidelines are far higher. With low income communities, the number is 46%. Within communities of color, it's 91%. And whereas the World Health Organization and the Minnesota Department of Health recognize clean air as a fundamental right, essential for human and environmental health and sustainable economy, pure air quality leads to missed work, school, and increased air pollution related illnesses. I will now um, turn this over to Councilmember Ellison to uh, share uh, the rest we left off at, whereas gasoline and diesel combustion in cars. Thank you, Council Vice President. Uh, and whereas gasoline and diesel combustion in cars, trucks, buses, tractor trailers, and construction equipment known as mobile source, uh, sources contribute up to half of all MP, uh, PM uh, 2.5 concentrations in highly populated urban areas, a large portion of air pollution also comes from smaller sources that are located in neighborhoods and combine to create a large effect. These sources include businesses that emit, emit uh, VOCs such as gas stations and auto body shops. And whereas short-term exposure to fine particle uh, particulate matter can result in asthma attacks, heart attacks, and death. Long-term exposure to particulate matter can result in heart and lung disease, cancers, and death. And whereas each year in the Twin Cities, fine particulate particle pollutions is estimated to cause more than 2,100 deaths, more than 200 respiratory hospitalizations, 91 cardiovascular hospitalizations, and about 400 emergency uh, department visits for asthma and whereas state air monitors measured a 20% decrease in nitrogen dioxide and fine particle levels for March, June, uh, March to June 2020 compared with the previous year, except in Phillips neighborhood where fine particles were up to 25% from the previous year. And whereas 
the exposure and impact of air pollution falls disproportionately and inequitably on black people, indigenous people, and communities of color. Your likelihood of living near a facility that emits pollution at a level above health guidelines is higher than average if you are a person of color or indigenous or a lower income. Zip codes with higher rates of poverty or more residents of color have higher than average levels of MP, PM uh, 2.5 pollution. The fraction of all cases attributable to PM 2.5 increases with increasing zip code poverty levels and residents of color for death, asthma respiratory hospitalizations, and asthma emergency uh, department visits. And whereas this is a persistent and historical issue, East Phillips neighborhood has a long history of industrial arsenic contamination in air, soil, and groundwater as found by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in the early 200, uh, 2000s due to an old pesticide manufacturing plant, an area known as the arsenic triangle, further compounded by pollution from bituminous roadways. Um, Smith Foundry and the Roof Depot continues to be of utmost concern of residents and environmental justice activists, especially pertaining to disruption of the soil and increased vehicle traffic. And whereas the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency in 2013 found Northern Metals Recycling source can be surrounding residents of North Minneapolis in an area already heavily industrialized and environmental justice activists have worked stead steadfastly to shut down its shredding operation and are currently seeking transparency and remediation for a fire that burned last month. And whereas in 2017, Minneapolis City Council adopted a resolution establishing the Green Zones environmental justice areas, recognizing that low-income communities, First Nations people, and people of color in Minneapolis experience significant economic and health disparities, as well as face disproportionate impacts of pollution, urban blight, and the adverse effects of climate change. And whereas in 2019, Minneapolis City Council adopted a resolution declaring a climate emergency, noting that the National Climate and Health Assessment of the United States Global Change Research Program identified climate change as a significant threat to the health of the people of the United States, leading to increased air quality uh, impacts and other negative health outcomes. Addressing the climate emergency through an economically just and managed phase out of the use of oil, gas, and coal to keep fossil fuels, fuels in the ground will also improve air quality for BIPOC and low income communities. And whereas last year, the mayor and city council declared racism a public health emergency in Minneapolis, resolving to develop and implement an annual report with racially disaggregated data to the health of Minneapolis Black, Indigenous, and people of color, including recommendations for actions to eliminate any disparities and improve overall health. That same year, the mayor and the council also approved a resolution establishing a truth and reconciliation process for the city of Minneapolis, focusing on historical harms against American Indian, indigenous peoples, and historically black descendants of slaves in Minneapolis. And whereas the city council last month approved a staff direction to suspend its water facility expansion plan and the demolition of the Route Depot site in East Phillips neighborhood in order to evac evaluate the financial and operational implications of terminating the city's interest in this parcel and recommending a process for how to sell all or a portion of the city owned property for use aligned with community led interests. Uh, and whereas several elected officials and public leaders last week have signed a letter to join environmental justice activists in demanding transparency, halting of operations and further investigation around Northern Metals recycling and for structural change in assessing health impacts for industrial sites following the fire last month. And Council Vice President, did you want to finish the, the, the now therefore? Thank you, um, Council Member Ellison. And so now therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and the city council do hereby designate the month of May as Clean Air Month and continue to take seriously and advance our mission of the city of Minneapolis which states our city government takes strategic action to address climate change, dismantle institutional injustice, and close disparities in health, housing, public safety, and economic opportunities.
and city leaders in partnership with residents help to ensure all communities thrive in a safe and healthy city. I want to just take a moment to thank um, uh, some uh, staff who helped to um, prepare this resolution. Uh, Ms. Kelly Melman, uh, the Sustainability and Program uh, Coordinator in the Office of Sustainability. Jenny Lansing, the Senior Environmental uh, Research Analyst in the Health Department. And AmeriCorps VISTA worker Julia Evelyn, uh, who is involved with the North Side and the uh, um, Promazone and Green, and I'm sorry, and North Side uh, Green Zones, as well as my own staff, uh, Senior Policy Aide um, Diva Sadar and um, um, Policy Associate Zoe Beaujere, as well as Council Member Ellison's staff who, who worked diligently, diligently to put this resolution together. Thank you so much, Madam President. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the resolution? And I'll, I'm not sure if it was officially stated, but I will take um, your presentation as moving the item. Uh, see no discussion. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Palmasano. Aye. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Cano. Aye. Council Member Rank. Aye. Council Member Fletcher. Aye. Council Member Schrader. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Allison. Aye. Vice President Jenkins. Aye. President Bender. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and the honorary resolution is adopted. Next, we have the order of announcements. Are there any announcements from council members this morning? Seeing none, with that, we've completed oh, Council Member Cunningham. Thank you, Madam President. Um, this um, is not a happy um, or positive announcement, but I think it is necessary for us to take a moment um, within our space as council members um, to pause and recognize that um, in the last few weeks, um, our city has had two children, um, Trinity Allen, I'm sorry, Anaya Allen and Trinity Ottoman Smith, who have died from gun violence. Um, Anaya was six and Trinity was nine. Um, I would like for us to pause um, in our space here um, to have a moment of silence for these two little girls. So if you will please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you for joining me for that. I want, while they were shot in North Minneapolis, I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna do my best. I'm very emotional about this. Um, while they were shot in North Minneapolis, they are, this happened in Minneapolis. This is not just a North Minneapolis problem. This is a Minneapolis problem. Their deaths cannot be normalized because of the fact that it happened in North Minneapolis. This violence, this kind of violence should not happen anywhere in our city. It cannot be normalized and it cannot be politicized. We have to come together 
and to honestly work together to be able to find solutions. Their lives mattered, and the fact that the city has not shut down in outrage um, is very hard for me um, as a Northside Council member who's in the middle of it. I myself heard the gunshots that ultimately killed Anaya because she was killed only a few blocks from my house. I heard the gunshots that shot a 10 year old only a couple of weeks before Trinity and Anaya were shot. Our city is better than this. And our kids deserve better than this. So I ask for all of you to join me in feeling this and to feel this grieving and to mourn alongside these families because this is Minneapolis, it's not just the north side. So I just wanted to make sure that that moment that these little girls passing did not be named in this space, their lives were not honored, and that we have to recognize that this is a Minneapolis problem and not just the north side. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cunningham. Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Madam President, and, and thank you, Council Member Cunningham. Um, and absolutely, this is a Minneapolis crisis um, that we all have to grapple with more and, and, and help our communities to overcome these tragedies. I, I just also wanted to just publicly acknowledge, you know, I don't I don't know if we have um, had the opportunity to do it on the dais, just the the also sad um, murder of of George Floyd, which earlier this week um, the city, the nation recognized the one year. Uh, anniversary and um, I, I just want to just offer my my condolences to all of the families that have lost lives to senseless violence and um, tragic murders. Um, your to your point, Councilmember Cunningham, we are better than this, and we have to demonstrate um, that by coming together and addressing and tackling these issues as a um, as a city that's committed to the ideals that our employees brought forth earlier in this conversation in this meeting today and um, the commitments that we have made to racial equity and justice in our communities and so um, I am publicly committing myself to continuing to do that work and um, certainly take your challenge to heart, Council Member Cunningham, as well as um, encourage all of my other council members, colleagues to do so as well. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Um, I think it's clear and has been and should continue to be clear that um, all of this violence is unacceptable and it is on every single member of this body to work together to stop community violence and to stop police violence and our city feels like it is in a cycle of harm and violence and force harm and violence and force that will take every single member of our community to break um, I do want to say something and I, I want to pause and, and speak carefully. Uh, last term, this body was quite divided. And when I started speaking with all of you about how we wanted this term to go and spoke with you about the council structure, you all told me that you wanted to be part of a group of people that could work together through differences. and whether you see it or not, or appreciate it or not, I have spent 
an enormous amount of time and energy the last three and a half years trying to hold this body together in that harmony, even through difference. We can debate, we can disagree, we have different constituencies, but we always come back together with a basic respect for each other's work, a basic respect for each other's election certificates and leadership. And in the last couple of weeks, I have seen folks operate in a way that does not adhere to that vision and those norms um, in a way that I haven't seen um, for this whole term. And I guess I just want to compel each of you to be part of that vision that you articulated. Um, I hope you meant it. I believe that we can come together as a body, um, but it, it really does require us to have some basic respect for each other. And I, I'm not sure I've really seen that in the last couple of weeks, to be honest. And I, I know it's election season, I know it's stressful. I have the advantage of not having to be part of all of that now, but um, I really mean this as a, as a plea for um, a return to some of those norms of this body. And I do want to specifically say that Councilmember Cunningham first uh, secured resources for violence prevention in North Minneapolis in 2017, before he was even a member of the city council. He came with kids, with members of the school community at Lucy Laney, and I was honored to work with him. Actually, then Councilmember Fry and I co-authored a package that included a lot of police spending and a very small amount of violence prevention dollars trying to save the work that had been started next term so that we could start this term with some very, very, very modest investments in violence prevention and Councilmember Cunningham leadership began even before he was in office. Um, so to those who are suggesting otherwise, I really just would compel you uh, to stop, please. <laughs> um, our colleague has been sitting with families who are facing unimaginable pain from losing their children. And he's certainly not the only one who's, who's doing that work, but um, I just do wanna honor his leadership and um, maybe push back on some of the narratives that have been um, insinuated or said in the last couple of weeks. They aren't true. Um, I guess I want to just close by regrounding in the lives of the two little girls that Councilmember Cunningham honored today and offer my commitment to continue to work with all of you um, to put an end to this. And I think our colleagues from the parts of the city who are experiencing the most violence come back to this body with an enormous amount of grace, sharing their experiences and really, um, maybe they should be more angry that there hasn't been more done um, than they even are. I think that we all need to be reminded of our responsibility for letting things um, come to this and our responsibility to uh, work together to put an end to it. Thank you. Is there anything further? Seeing none and without objection, I will call this meeting adjourned. <laughs>